up today, we ride the latest Triumph Street Triple R, find out what's new in the Hyundai Aura, and visit Tata Motors' first vehicle scrappage facility, Tata Motors Rewire. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini That Triumph has introduced three new models in its very popular Street Triple lineup. And one of the motorcycles that we are riding today is the Street Triple R. We're going to find out whether these incremental changes make it a very compelling buy in 2023. In the world of street naked motorcycles, the Triumph Street Triple holds a very special place. Its compact dimensions, its fruity engine, its lean bodywork and very comfortable ergonomics make it one of the friendliest street nakeds out there. As before, there are the R and RS models to choose from. And while the S variant was only deleted from the Indian lineup a few years back, it has now been given the boot altogether in the new model line. Its spot is filled in by the Trident, which also brings back fond memories of the Street Triple 675. But in comparison, the new Street Triples are meaner, quicker and more powerful. And like the last generation, the Street Triple R is yet again the variant that most will choose from in this model line. This isn't an all-new bike, but there are so many changes that it qualifies as one. The stance is more aggressive, and while it's instantly recognizable as a street triple with its bug eyes and skinny silhouette, the new model can be identified with its leaner and more angular bodywork, with tank extensions that now sit much closer to the tank, almost creating the effect of a side fairing. The tail section is also much sleeker now, and the chassis is exactly similar to the outgoing model but employs a more aggressive rake angle and a shorter wheelbase than before. To go with the compact dimensions, the tank is smaller too, at 15 litres. The flatter profile of the tank has made way for a more pronounced dome, and attaching the tank bag on the fuel filler ring will place it quite tall and close to your chest. Now, the standard seat height of 826mm for my height of 5 feet 8, feels quite easy to get on and off the motorcycle. It's very manageable even in parking spaces. Getting both your feet flat on the ground at my height, not a problem at all. But if you need a shorter seat, there is a low seat option which drops the seat height by a further 28 millimeters. If you manage to ride the previous Street Triple and the new one back to back, you may realize that the latter feels a bit more agile. So be it the narrow lanes of India or the B roads or your favourite twisties, you will always park the motorcycle grinning. It feels easy to manoeuvre in tight spots. It also feels breezy around U-turns, as breezy as before if not better. But you'll be astonished to find that a minimal 12mm increment on the handlebar can offer so much more leverage. In fact, you'll have to try the old bike and the new one back. The Street Triple remains one of the easiest middleweight bikes to ride in the city and on the highway. But when on the highway, you will realize that the shorter crown doesn't really offer much wind or weather protection. The weather in Spain was quite chilly during our ride, so the engine only felt comfortably warm and cozy even in the slow moving conditions, but is likely to turn up the heat in the Indian traffic and your thighs will continue to feel the brunt of it. There's also a new exhaust system, which is common across the range. It's now one single unit from the header pipe to the tailpipe. You cannot have different parts. You can't have just a slip on. You will have to change the entire system or you'll have to run modifications. So again, best of luck with that. There are four riding modes to choose from. The regular rain, road and sport and a user configurable mode. And as you would expect, the rain mode is the most docile and restricts the power output to around 100 PS. Now, the modes can be changed on the fly. There is no track mode, which is, of course, exclusive to the RS. But you may have noticed that the instrumentation is similar to the Tiger Sport 660. Of course, cheaper bikes than the Street Triple R, they were still getting a more advanced instrumentation. So this ought to have come by now. But what I really miss from that older analog unit on the Street Triple R are those blue shift lights, especially when riding hard. They were always in your peripheral vision, guiding you when to shift. Here, it's not the same. I miss that. The engine makes 2 PS more now, which would be hard to notice even if you ride the old and the new Street Triple R back to back. We didn't really have complaints about the previous motor, but the new one edges ahead with a slightly crisper throttle response. 
That said, the throttle response doesn't feel as crisp as it is on the RS. The engine certainly feels a lot more refined than before and 10 PS difference between the R and the RS may not seem like much but that throttle response, that is where the difference is quite evident even if you engage the sport mode. Now I remember on the previous 3 RRR, it got a little buzzy after about 9000 RPM. I don't know if the Indian fuel is to blame for that but this one seems to have ironed that out. The entire rev range feels quite smooth. There are no patches or zones in between where you will feel a lot of buzzy performance. We've seen that on some of the newer Triumph engines but here it just feels super refined, creamy smooth. The red line is still at the same 12,650 RPM but it is the mid-range pull that is considerably better especially in the third, fourth and fifth gears. There's also less intrusion from the electronics thanks to a new IMU that comes from Continental. It ensures that the traction control system isn't as paranoid or as intrusive as before. The Pirelli Rosso 3 tyres from the previous R have made way for these new Continental Conti Road. Now the tyre sizes remain the same. Uh, as far as the rubber goes, I really didn't have any complaints riding around quite hard here in Spain. The suspension hardware is more or less similar to the outgoing Street Tripla, meaning that you get Showa's 41mm big piston separate function forks that are individually adjustable for rebound and damping using the speciality tool provided by Triumph. The braking hardware remains unchanged too. I'm a fan of the M4.32 brakes on the previous model. I think they work excellent on the road and they continue to do so even with the new model. That said, there is now a combined ABS system with the new IMU which analyzes the force that you apply at the front lever and automatically applies a bit of the rear brakes to maintain balance and composure. So even if your suspension is set up to a softer setting, there isn't too much nose dive to complain about. So the new Street Triple R may look very aggressive on the outside but it is still that friendly middleweight street naked that we've loved over the years. Now becoming more powerful and safer than before, it certainly poses a threat to its competition, the more premium competition from Germany, Italy and even Austria. And at the same time, it manages to offer more bang for the buck than the Japanese competition. Here with us on Overdrive, Hyundai's compact sedan, the Aura, has been given an update. It now gets a contemporary front grille and it also gets new features inside the cabin and also safety equipment to make it a more compelling buy. Tuin will find out whether it really makes a big difference. Now, compact sedans may not be all the rage that they were a few years ago, but if you want affordable, practical family motoring, there's still a solid option considering the premium that you need to pay to get an SUV in your parking. So here we have the new Hyundai Aura. It's got a midlife update and today we'll tell you everything that's changed about it. Now we brought along an older Hyundai Aura to show you exactly what the new changes are to the newer compact sedan. And of course, you can't miss this new grille, which is the most prominent change. And it's got this much more contemporary two-part design with these horizontal design elements and these honeycomb effect patterns in it. So it's a much more contemporary look. That's the same with this new 2D Hyundai badge. And of course, the headlamp cluster remains the same, but you get these new L-shaped or inverted L-shaped DRLs and they do generally lift the look of the new aura. Although a sad thing is that you don't get fog lamps anymore. The facelifted aura remains the same aside from this. So like before, there is some finesse to the glass house, although the fairly large 402 litre boot could have been integrated better. The distinct factory fitted spoiler remains, as do those large tail lamps. As with the front, you now get the crisper 2D badging here too. Now as it was with the outside, even on the inside, the changes to the new Hyundai Aura aren't all that extensive, but there are some notable additions. The biggest of which is this new instrument cluster. It's a far more modern looking one with crisp analog dials and a clear MID which shows you pretty much all the information you need. And it's a far cry from that digital readout that you had from earlier. Among other changes, you now get a Type-C USB port and you also get footwell lighting. There's been more thought given to safety as well. You get auto headlamps, ESC and hill start assist. Carried over are four airbags as standard and TPMS and ISOFIX seat mounts on top trims. So this adds to the Hyundai Aura's already long list of features. So you have this nice 7-inch screen, climate control, a wireless charger, height adjustable seating, 
as well as push button start. So all in all, if you want a feature packed compact sedan, the Hyundai Aura does have you covered. The cabin itself remains unchanged. So it's a premium feeling space for this segment with the bronzed honeycomb highlights, a design that is still simple but contemporary with the above par sense of finish that you get from Hyundai's. Some bits like the indicator stocks could have been updated and there could have been more storage in the central tunnel, although the dash shelf makes up for it to an extent. Now look at the rear seat of the Hyundai Aura and you notice that it's a fairly usable space, especially if you're a small family of four or maybe even five. To start with, this bench is wide. It's a bit flat, which means that say around turns, you will get rolled around a bit. But that also means that three people can sit fairly comfortably, especially if the middle one is a child. This central tunnel is also not very high, which is a good thing. And there's also good under thigh support, so you won't be too uncomfortable. If you're a medium height, there's good knee room. It tightens a bit if you're a taller, but you also have leg space. So you can stretch out in any case and you won't be that uncomfortable. It's the same with the headroom, it's good. Although if you are tall, you might just scrape the top of the roof. But that being said, for what it is, this is a really good space. Now, some of the other things that you find here is a center armrest. It's useful, you can park your arms like this. But you only get one charging port. It's just a 12 volt outlet, no charger as, as such. So, which means that between the people sitting behind, you will be fighting for who gets to charge their phone and so on. The Hyundai Aura can now be had with a single 1.2 litre naturally aspirated petrol. The turbo and the diesel have now been discontinued. So the outputs are adequate for what will essentially be a city commuter. And in that sense, the Aura's motor does the job. So you notice that at low revs, say below 2000 RPM, it's fairly tractable. So you can say, take a speed breaker in second gear. You don't need to shuffle between gears all that much in traffic. So in that sense, it's an easy car to get used to. And paired with that, the clutch is not very heavy, it's quite light and progressive. The gear shifts are precise and slick, fairly slick, so which means that driving the Aura is not very difficult. Having said that, as you keep going further up the rev range, you do notice a slight dip in performance, say when you're in between 3 and 5,000 RPM. So if you want to make a quick overtake, that will take some planning. It is anyway not a fast car. But yeah, overtakes will need a touch more planning than they would have otherwise needed. But other than that, it's as fast as you need a family car to be there. Now coming to the ride and handling of the Hyundai Aura. The steering is light, so it's not very difficult to use, but we would have liked it to have been a bit more precise. And you do notice that it doesn't recenter all that well. So when you're taking a U-turn, you'll notice that you might have to put a bit more effort at turning the steering back to center. And that can get slightly unnerving at times, but I'm sure you can get used to it. And as for the way it goes over bumps, again, it's fine at lower speeds over mildly rough uneven surfaces like we are driving on right now. But show it a big bump and it does thud through to an extent, but never to be jarring or too uncomfortable. But you do notice that at highway speeds, it does move around a little bit over undulations and so on. So that can take some getting used. But other than that, like with the engine, the Hyundai Aura is a car you can get used to driving very easily, very quickly. Priced between Rs. 6.29 lakh and Rs. 8.72 lakh, the Hyundai Aura is one of the more affordable compact sedans around. It could have done with a bigger change overall on the outside at least, and more mature driving dynamics. But as a family runabout, there's not much missing. A long features list pleasant cabin and good space being the top positive. The vehicle's traffic policy in India was announced way back in August 2021 by the Prime Minister of India to ensure that unfit vehicles both in the commercial vehicle as well as the passenger vehicle space would have a systematic way of being recycled. Today as it stands, there are 12 such facilities in the country and Tata Motors has taken a giant step towards this initiative by inaugurating their very first registered vehicle scrappage facility in Jaipur. Let's take a look at this facility. Tata Motors Rewire is built on a five-acre plot on the Jaipur-Rajmer Highway that offers a sustainable alternative to end-of-life vehicles. 
We are inside Tata's Rewire facility, which stands for Recycle with Respect. It has the capacity to dismantle 15,000 vehicles, commercial as well as passenger vehicles in total annually. But on a daily basis, 50 vehicles can be dismantled here. It starts with two uh, dismantling lines for the passenger and small commercial vehicles and it moves on to four stations for the large commercial vehicles. We'll take a deeper look into how all of this functions. The process for both passenger and commercial vehicles starts with a thorough evaluation of the vehicle and documents to identify components and use parts that can be sold as for policy guidelines. At the commercial vehicle cell, the vehicle is first sent to the depollution bay, after which the load body is dismantled, followed by cabin and chassis until the bare body shell remains. In the passenger and small commercial vehicle lines, the vehicles are systematically run through four stations, starting with the depollution station, where the batteries are removed, airbags exploded, and vehicles drained of all lubricants and oil. The vehicle then moves on to the next station for removal of wheels, doors, lights, then on to the next to dismantle the seats and bumpers, after which the engine, gearbox and axle is dismantled, followed by removing of glass, dashboard and wiring of the vehicle. Finally, the bare body shell is put into the baler. All tyres and plastics collected from the stations are then taken to the scrapyard, while the engine and axle is sent for deep dismantling. The final scrap material is then sent off to various interested parties. The Rajasthan and the area nearby Jaipur area has an end of life vehicle law load of 6 lakh vehicles. And this center will be a great starting point for the scrapping industry in Rajasthan and Northern India. It is fully digitalized for hassle-free paperless operations and has dedicated stations for safe demanding of scrap components and materials. Friends, we are marching ahead with our vision led by Prime Minister Sri Modi ji with a focus on becoming Atmanirvar Bharat. The registered vehicle scrappage facility that we see today is a state-of-the-art facility which adheres to globally approved processes and has modern equipment for safe and sustainable vehicle scrapping and recycling. Today marks a momentous day as we inaugurate our first end-of-life vehicle scrappage facility, which will enable complete life cycle management and extend benefits to all stakeholders of the society. As the vehicle scrappage policy comes into effect on the 1st of April, Tata Motors is working on setting up 12 more such registered vehicle scrappage facilities across the country, which sets into motion Sri Nitin Gadkari's vision of setting up one scrappage facility per 150 km distance in every district. <laughs>